guys, I want to tell you something. We're all in the slingshot of God right now. Yeah. We're loaded, baby. Right? And now we have the honor of going out and doing what God asks us to do before Jesus left the earth. The great Does everybody know what the Great Commission is? The Great Commission says, go into all Right, you guys are are, uh, are 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 bombarded with a 
a world of lies trying to tell you that you're one thing when you're not. You're not your mistakes. You're not your disappointments. You're not even your talents. Your talents don't define you, right? Scripture tells us that we are God's craftsmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So it's time for you to stand in that. So we're up here worshiping. If you haven't given your heart to Christ, I want you to take the time to do that today, okay? Don't leave this place without being made new. All right, let's worship.
just want to give it, I want you guys to give it your all during this worship. This is our last time we get to worship together as a camp, and I just want you to give it your all for this last song.
God, I want to thank you for this week at camp. I want to thank you for the hearts that you touched this week. I ask that you just be with them always and that you just instill in them the fact that you're always there and you're always going to be there for them through all the pain, through all the suffering, through all the hardships, whatever it may be. Just make yourself known to them. Show yourself to them. Let them go home unashamed and proud of who they are and who you are. Just fill them with a fire that never, never goes out. Constantly refilled. Just fill them with that. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Hard to believe it's the last day, huh? Maybe your body feels it. <laughs> if you're old like me, your body was feeling it. How many of you guys have been speaking to you this week? How many of you, you know, as you've gotten quiet before the Lord, you feel like he's been speaking to you about things that you should do when you go home? It's okay. I want to see hands. God been speaking to you about things you should do when you go home. Maybe stir in your heart. <clears throat> you know, it's um, I want to tell you a story. <clears throat> I brought this baseball bat because uh, no. But I did bring it because it's just a plastic bag. But uh, so when I was a little kid, uh, when I was a little kid, um, you know, I, I mentioned the thing. I didn't really have a dad around. So my mom did her best, bless her heart. And she put me like on a, like a, like a, like a baseball team um, when I was little. And uh, I had really no one ever played. I had never played baseball in my life. You know, I mean, that's part of not having a dad around. I didn't, I didn't do those kinds of things. Um, and so I really didn't have any experience. And I was scared of the baseball. I'm going to tell you straight up. And so I, I remember getting out there, and it was like I was, you know, they put me out there to hit the ball, and they would, someone would throw the ball, and I would just stand there, like frozen. <laughs> like, oh, I don't, and, and I was scared, not, not so much as scared as getting, of getting hit. I was scared that I would swing the bat and miss. And I was so afraid of, of, of missing that I wouldn't even swing the bat. Whoa, come on. Oh. I would just, like, stand there, and the ball would go over. One, two. I mean, like, my hope was, like, maybe they'll hit me, and I can run to first. <laughs> or, the, or the pitcher will mess up, and I can run to first, you know. I, but I, I was so afraid that, like, if I swung the bat, I would miss, and everyone would laugh at me. Uh, and so I remember, I, I, it, it wasn't just like a one-time event. I mean, I went through the whole season that way. Oh, wow. I went through the whole season. I would just stand there, you know, and nobody was coaching me at home or telling me anything. And I remember just like, and I got laughed at. Like, my big fear is that I wouldn't, I wouldn't swing and I would get laughed at. And I was getting laughed at because I wouldn't swing. You know, it became a joke. Oh, there's a kid who won't swing the bat. You know, easy out, you know. Because um, kids are nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I remember just standing there and the ball would come and the very last game of the season very last game of the season my coach came up to me and he was just like hey Ronnie you know we go out there today and you go up to bat I just want you to swing just get out there and just swing just get out there and do it just, just swing the bat 
He goes, and I don't care if you hit the ball. I don't care if you hit it or you don't hit it. I just don't want you to go through the whole season and you never even tried. Wow. I don't want you to go through the whole season and you never even swung. He said, just get out there and swing. Just swing at everything. <laughs> just, <laughs> whatever they throw, you just, just try to hit it. <laughs> you know, and um, I went up to bat. And uh, they threw the first ball, and I, I did what I always did. I froze up. I was like, ah! The coach is in the back room, background saying, just do it! Just swing! Just swing the bat! <laughs> you can do it, Ronnie! And, uh, you know, they threw the next ball, and, uh, and I hit it. And it was a home run. No, no, no. That's, that's like a Disney movie. No, it didn't, that's not what happened. I, I, did, I, did, I did hit the ball. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, might, I don't even remember if I made it to first. I mean, I hit it, and I it, you know, moved the bat. But the whole point was, like, I finally put the effort in, and I hit the ball. You know, it was, uh, it was really the first time I swung the bat all season, so I guess that's something. <laughs> um, but the, the reason I wanted to tell a story today is because I believe there's things that God is calling each of you to do. There's things that God spoke to you here at camp. Yeah, come on. But then beyond camp, there's things that God's calling you to do in life. And if we're going to succeed in life, uh, I have a slide. If we're going to succeed in life, it's going to take some risk. Yeah. I can go to my next one, actually. Take some risk. And I want to talk to you a little about risk this morning. It's maybe not a topic you hear a lot about in church, uh, but it's an important topic it's a, and it, because it has to do with faith. And walking in faith and doing things that you haven't done before. Because walking by faith requires risk, taking risks. Yeah. You see here my picture, got a little goldfish, and he's trying to move into a greater life. <laughs> There's some risk involved there. What's the risk? Uh, he well, he could die. <laughs> That's the risk. <laughs> there is risk involved, though. When we want to step up, we want to move in greater things, we want to be better people. Sometimes we have to take risks. And so we're going to talk about that a little this morning because I believe there's things that God has told you guys to do. There's things that God has told you to do. Some of you, God's been speaking to you here at camp. Some of you, um, some of you, God's been speaking to you at camp. Others, others, you know, leaving camp, there's things that God's going to speak to you. But the thing is, it's, this is a lifelong thing. It's not like you take one risk and life, you're done. This is a lifelong lesson that you need to learn. Come on. It's a lifelong lesson you need to learn. If you're going to do anything significant in this world or for the kingdom of God, you are going to have to take some risks. Right. And so we have three, we have basically three possibilities regarding risk, and I'm going to talk about that. Um, how many of you like to hear exciting testimonies? I have a lot of stories I tell you. you like, who likes exciting testimonies? All right. The thing about an exciting, a really exciting testimony is it always starts with some kind of trial or problem. I mean, like, if I was like, hey, I came to church this morning, and the, the weather was beautiful, my car had gas, and I got here, no problems. I mean, that's a great testimony, but no one gets really excited. But it's great. I didn't have any problems, you know, but, but like, if I talked about some kind of supernatural deliverance, you know, or something like that, it's like, oh, that's exciting. The thing is, is the exciting testimonies always involve some amount of danger or trial or problem and risk. Yeah. Yeah. True. There's no testimony without a trial. Not really. You know, and you think about it. Moving and acting in faith requires risk, but there's a lot of things you're going to do in life that are going to require risk. Like, you want to go to college? There's a certain amount of risk involved. You're leaving home. You're going away. You're gonna, someday you're going to move out on your own. There's risk involved in that. Yeah. You're going to get married someday. How many of you are married? Was there risk involved in getting married? Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, no, no, we don't need really strong amens. You know, like, <laughs> just like, yes. You know, Low-key amens better there. Yeah. Yeah, there's risk involved in getting married. There's risk involved. You know, and there's risk in serving Jesus. There is. Yep. If you're going to step out in faith and do things God's called you to do, there, there's a certain amount of risk involved. Yeah. Now, if you're just going to say a little prayer, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, and yeah. you're going to live your life the same way, there's no risk involved in that because that's not true Christianity. Come on. Come on. But if we're like, I'm going to serve God, yeah. that means maybe you're cutting off certain relationships. 
And there's risk involved. There's risk yeah. when you're telling people, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to go drinking with you guys anymore. I, yeah. I, I love you all. I care about you. You know, that's, that's not my scene anymore. Yeah. There's a risk involved in that. There's risk. You're putting yourself out there. When you let people know you're a Christian, there's risk involved. You can just be quiet and not tell anybody, but that's really not the Great Commission, is it? No. Nope. I mean, if you were in love with somebody, you would let people know. I mean, if you really love someone, you're not going to hide the fact that you care about them. If you've got to hide that relationship, there's something wrong. Yep. Say it. Come on. And there's nothing wrong with this relationship. If you made a commitment here at camp to, receive, to follow Jesus, or you made it before camp, or you make it after camp, you get home, and God shakes some sense in you, there's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> nothing to be ashamed of. But there is risk involved. Because there will always be somebody to make fun of you. There's always going to be somebody to cast doubt on your decision. Um, the little thing here says, the dogs of doubt are always barking in front wow. of the door of your promise. Whenever you've got this decision in front of you, you've got a, a situation in front of you, and you need to step out in faith, you have to take a risk, there's always going to be somebody naysaying, nay, it won't work. <laughs> When I became a believer, I remember I'm, I'm serving the Lord. I started serving the Lord uh, here in Missouri. I was born in Michigan, born again in Missouri. And I remember talking to some of my friends back in Michigan. And one of my older friends calls me on the phone just to tell me that there's no way that I could really be a Christian. He goes, because the devil, he goes, the devil's all over you and he's controlling you. There's no way that you can be a believer. I was literally, you know, more or less what he said. Um, I don't remember exactly what he said because I let it wash off, honestly. I was like, you know, that's not true. I didn't, I didn't see the need to memorize it. I remember something basically about you got the devil or something like that. But, you know, the thing was, is like that wasn't true. But there's always going to be people like that to speak negative things over you. You're like, I'm going to serve Jesus, and they're going to throw your past in your face. But, you know, God's not doing that. Nope. God's not doing it. When... when when God sent An Ananias to pray for, for Paul, you know, Paul was persecuting Christians. And after he, he became a believer, you know, he, he, he had that vision of Jesus, and he's sitting there blind. He told Ananias to go pray, Ananias to go pray for Paul that he could receive his sight. And you remember what, how he responded? He was like, oh, Lord, that guy, yeah. he, you know, I've heard what he's doing. He's throwing Christians in prison, and he's doing all these things. And, you know, the Lord didn't listen to him. He was like, no, go, go, go to him. He didn't, he didn't like reinforce that, you know, because God takes our past and he, what does he do with our sins? Cast them behind his back. Remember we talked about it. God cast them behind his back. He's choosing not to remember those things. And he spoke about Paul's future, not about his past. Right. Yeah. Amen. So there, but there is risk involved when we take these steps. There is risk involved. So we have three possibilities regarding risk. And the first possibility regarding risk is, what does it say? What if oh, wait. You know what? Like, because everybody's tired. I, I, you know what? I, I brought the bat. We should do something. We did something like this last night. What, 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 what did we do last night? Every time I put my hands up, what did you guys do? Stood up. No, 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 no. Wait, what did you do? Come on. Wait, okay, come on. All right, all right. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Ah, let's try it again. Okay, I got another one this morning. I got another one. It'll keep everybody awake. Okay, because I told my little baseball story. So every time I swing the bat, every time I swing the bat, I want you guys to say, just do it. Or we're going to, all right, like, you know, like the commercial. All right, let's, let's go. Okay, all right, just do it. That's good. Good, good, good. All right, we'll practice one more time. All right, all right. Okay. So our, if you can stand up, if you're, if you're too, too weak to stand up, that's okay. I won't judge you. I won't judge you if you're too weak or too tired and frail to stand up. I mean, we should have mercy on, you know. <clears throat> okay. So the first possibility with risks, what does it say? Well, read it with me. What does it say? What if I never take risks? That's the same as saying what? 
What if I do nothing? Look, that baby looks bored. Look how bored he looks. Uh, you know, if you're unwilling, if you're unwilling to take any risks, you're unwilling to take steps of faith in any area of your life, you're going to have a pretty boring life. Like that baby. I mean, he's just like, rescue me from this, please. Look at that face. All right. Hebrews. I got another slide. Hebrews 11.6 says, what does it say? Read it with me. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Read that part again. Read it again. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Read it again. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Oh, what was Okay, read it again. And without faith, all near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. See, walking in faith requires risk. I have a little phrase I want you to remember. It says, with, I got it right there on the screen. What does it say at the bottom? Without risk? Without risk, there's no reward. Because stepping out in faith is risk. You take a risk. When we're in heaven with Jesus and we can touch and feel and see, that's not faith anymore. But right now, we, we walk with eyes of faith and we're believing. And there's a certain amount of risk. But it's, it, it's a calculated risk. It's something I've done it enough. In my case, I feel I've done it enough that I'm confident and I can. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not. But when you're starting, sometimes it can really seem scary if it's the first time you've ever done something. You know? Totally. Okay, so let's keep going. <clears throat> we talked about all exciting testimonies start with a crisis. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Uh, all, all, all. all Exciting testimonies start with a crisis, problem, or risk. So I worked with this couple in Mexico. Um, that Before I worked with them in Mexico, we did a church plant together. Before that, when they were recently married, they were just like newlyweds, they decided they were going to open a home in Waco, Texas for homeless people and for people off the street, like a rescue house. They didn't have a lot of money. It was, their name Bill and Tammy Woods, and they were going to open this home in Waco and... They got all the paperwork together. They found the property, and, but they didn't have any money for the deposit. Um, but they went and talked to the bank, and they're trying to lay out the loan. And Bill said he was all dressed up, and the banker's sitting behind his desk, and him and Tammy are sitting there, and the banker's going through all the paperwork, like, okay, everything looks fine. At the end, the banker's like, okay, now uh, who's going to pay? Where, are you, do you have a check for the deposit, or how are you going to pay the deposit? And uh, Bill said he was like, um, my father is sending the check. Wow. And like my father's sending the check and the banker's like oh okay is your, your, your father live here in Waco is he like a businessman or something and Bill said well my father lives in Arizona my earthly father he goes but I'm talking about my heavenly father he said the banker just like he's like looking at his paperwork and he looked up at him like are you, are you like being serious like you know what are you talking about he goes like he goes, you didn't, you, you didn't come into my office and waste all my time, did you, this morning? He goes, because this is a serious transaction, uh, and it won't go through if I don't have the deposit. And so they gave him a date, like they gave him like a week, and, the, and, uh, and Bill and Tammy went and prayed. and Because uh, they really had felt like God was telling them to move forward. And by the end of the week, uh, somebody, they knew, I mean, it was a kind of a weird thing. They sent them a check in the mail, and they ended up getting a check in the mail for the deposit amount. Uh, but it was just a step of faith. And it really, and it, and it can be scary when you're putting your neck out there. Like, I feel like God is telling me to do this, and maybe it won't work. You know, it's like, I don't know, was that just, because you have that question sometimes. You know, like, was that God speaking to me, or was that, was that just my flesh? Was that just my mind? You know, so we have these possibilities when we're going to take risks. Like I said, one is, what if I do nothing? But the other, other possibility is, oh, wait, wait, oh, is what does it say? <laughs> what if I take a risk and I fail? So 
This poor kid tried to jump over the fence. He tried to jump over the fence and he didn't make it. Okay. I just wanted to wake you up this morning. I knew everybody was tired. Um, what if I take a risk? Read it with me. What does it say? What if I try and fail? That is a genuine possibility. When you're taking a risk, there's a risk. Even when it, in things of faith, there's a risk that maybe you didn't hear clearly what the Lord wanted you to do. There's also the risk that God spoke to you very clearly and failure was part of the plan. Yeah. Wow. Sometimes failure is part of the plan. Because God is, is using it to shape us, to break us, to change us, and he's working things into our heart. Failure isn't horrible. Sometimes it's part of the plan of God to teach us and to train us, to change our character. Or sometimes it's a, failure is one of the ways that God uses to steer us in a new direction. Failure isn't the end of the world. It's okay. It's a part of growth. We just need to fail forward. Yes. I remember um, in 1997, you know, during a time of prayer, I was ordained with a, was, I was being ordained by a certain denominational group. And uh, during the ordination service, the Lord spoke to my heart. Actually, uh, I had a vision. Um, and I felt like the Lord told me to go to Mexico. I put in my two month notice at the church where I was working. And I went. Uh, I didn't raise any support. I didn't speak Spanish. I didn't really know where I was going. Um, I, my, my pastor's wife had met somebody in our group that was going to San Luis Potosí to start Mexico to start a church. Talked to him in an elevator for like five minutes. She was like, I think you should go with this guy. And I went with that guy without really, I had never talked to him myself. I train missionaries today. I broke every single rule that I tell missionaries to follow. <laughs> it was horrible. It was a hard year. It was a hard year. I suffered in so many needless ways. Wow. Uh, I, I suffered in so many needless ways because of my ignorance and going through it. So much so that I remember at one point in that year, I, I was uh, sitting in a church service. I was sitting in a church service in uh, San Luis Potosí. So it was a big church service. I mean, there was like, you know, 800 people there, something like that. And all these people are there. And uh, they brought a preacher in. Like, I was barely learning Spanish. And they brought a preacher in who was uh, from Brazil. And he was preaching in Portuguese with a translator to Spanish. I didn't have a clue what was going on in the service. <laughs> you know, I'm just sitting there. And I'm miserable, and I was depressed, and feeling sorry for myself, like, oh, what am I doing here? Yeah. And, I, and I remember just sitting there and asking, you know, like, the service is ending, and the guy's up on the stage, and I was like, God, just looking around, I was like, you know, when I was in the U.S., like, I was actually seeing some fruit with what was going on in my life. I, and I was like, I felt like I was being a little productive, and I'm, what am I doing here? I was like, what am I doing here? And I remember asking the Lord, say, do you have more for me than this? Do you have more for me than this, God? Oh. Or is this what you want? I mean, I'm going to do what you want, but is there more? And uh, the service ended, you know, and whatever that guy was talking about. And at the very end, the, the, the preacher's on the stage. I'm way back in the audience. He calls me out of the crowd. Like, every, the service is over. But he calls me out of the crowd to come down front. And he says something to me in Portuguese, which obviously I didn't understand. And then, like, he, sa he, he talks to the translator. The translator's telling me in Spanish. And I just, like, understood just barely what he was saying. And I, I, mean, I was feeling so down. Like, like, you know, my translation skills are even worse than normal. It was like, oh, you know. Um, and the guy looks at me, and he's like, you speak English. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh, yeah, I speak English. <laughs> and he says, the Lord says he has more for you than this. And uh, you know what? I was like, okay. Wow. And uh, you know, I realized, uh, and I didn't understand it then. I didn't understand it till a while later. I understand it now that my current job, 
that fa my failure at the beginning was all part of the plan. It was part of the plan because my job today is I, I work, I'm, I'm the director of mobilization for World Indigenous Missions. Part of my job is I train missionaries. And as part of our training, I will talk about all these things I did and how that worked and all of these different ways you can go about doing. But I can tell them from personal experience. You know, and, and I, I see how God used those events and that part of my life to even help shape our training program to prepare people to go on the field and live in foreign countries. But the failure was part of the process. And so there's things that God might speak to you and put you through, and, and maybe it won't go the way you think it should have, but that doesn't mean it wasn't the Lord's will. Failure is part of the process. We can't be afraid of failure. And sometimes we'll fail because we just heard wrong, we just did it wrong. I mean, it's okay. It's part of learning the way we're supposed to walk and where we're supposed to go and trying to learn to follow the Lord's voice. Amen? So good. So I got another slide here. The, uh, ah, what does that one say? It is far better to fail in the attempt to do something great than to succeed at doing nothing. And I believe God has great things for each of you. I believe he's called you to raise up families that love him and for you to serve him. And really, there's no greater call than that. There's no greater call than that, to love God and walk in relationship with your creator. And beyond that, I believe there's other things that God has called each of you to do, but it's going to require some risk. All right, are you married? One more time. Just do okay. It. Yes, just do it. Um, okay, so so outside the church, can you guys think that there's been some famous, real famous guys who've had failures? What about Thomas Edison? Anybody ever heard of Thomas Edison? He invented the light bulb, didn't he? Yes. No, it's okay. You know, when Edison was in school, he was told he was too stupid to learn anything. Yeah. One of his teachers told him that. He was too stupid to learn anything. He was fired from his first two jobs uh, for not being productive enough. And as an inventor, Edison made like a thousand unsuccessful attempts at inventing the light bulb before they got the right one. Um, you know, sometimes we don't think about that. We just think, oh, this is a person who did this, but we don't... Think about all the failures yep. that went in before. So what do we need to do? Just okay. All right. We got to put, God puts it on your heart. You need to do it. Um, Vincent Van Gogh. Anybody heard of Vincent Van Gogh? Oh, yeah. I love his art. You love his art. How much does Vincent Van Gogh's artwork go for today? Like millions of dollars, right? Do you know how many paintings Vincent Van Gogh sold during his lifetime? One. He sold real cheap to a friend during a hard time. He painted like over 800. But he only sold one during his lifetime and now they're worth millions. Sometimes when we think we're failing, we just don't know. Maybe it's just, we haven't seen the fruit of it yet. It might feel like, uh, you know, I remember uh, when I was a youth leader, there's one kid in the youth group that he was always a clown. He was always a clown, always a clown, never was paying attention. And you think, I don't think he's listening to anything I'm saying. I don't know if he's hearing me at all. You know, and, and sometimes, and then I came back years later, and that kid ended up being like the youth leader. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just don't know. You don't know what God's doing in people's hearts and what seed you're sowing. You can't, you don't know. Because you plant the seed, you plant the seed, and then God causes it to grow. And we don't know. All we do is... Try to put the water of the word on it. Trust it to him. Amen? Yeah. You don't know. Um, anyway. Oh, okay. Wake you up a little. Okay, I got, one, I got one more sports illustration. What about Michael Jordan? Right. Michael Jordan. <laughs> okay. But he did decent at basketball. Okay, so... Michael Jordan, I have a quote from Michael Jordan. He said, I have missed, I have missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I have lost almost 300 games. On 26 occasions, I was entrusted to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. Right. Uh, failure is just, 
it's a part of the process. So we shouldn't be afraid of it. And even in the things of faith, you know, sometimes when you're feeling like God's telling you to speak something or move yeah. or do things, sometimes you'll get it wrong. It's, okay. it's part of learning to hear the voice of the Lord. Yeah. But it, if you don't do anything, if you never take the risk, you won't grow. You won't grow. Anybody ever heard of uh, Reinhard Bonnke? Yes. Oh. Reinhard Bonnke, like, they recorded, like, oh. they prayed with, like, a million people in one service to receive yeah. Christ, like, in one service. I just finished reading his autobiography. He passed away recently. Yeah. Um, I finished reading his uh, autobiography. Or you can do it as an audio book. It's, like, 30 hours. Um, but it, it's, it's a great book. Uh, but one thing he mentioned in there, his ministry was really well noted for, like, you know, extraordinary miracles. There were a lot of people healed during their crusades. Many, many people healed. People raised from the dead, blind eyes open, like documented cases of miracles. Um, but one thing he says in the book that a lot of people don't realize, he goes, for every, every miracle that we have recorded, those great miracles, there's like 100 people we prayed for who weren't healed. He goes, but we prayed for all of them. We prayed for all of them. And the thing is, is sometimes we want to see God move in power, but we have to be willing to step out in faith. And sometimes, you know, God's not Santa Claus. Right. You know, the results are up to him. We pray, we ask, and then we trust him. Yes. Then we trust him with the results. We can't make things happen, and we shouldn't even try. We just need to obey. Yes. Amen? Yep. So the question was, well, the first possibility was, what, what if I do nothing, which is boring, what if I try and I fail? So what's the third possibility then? What if I try? I got another slide. What if I do it and succeed? What if I do it and succeed? Yes, he says. <clears throat> I got a little thing up there. It says crisis equals opportunity. You know, because hidden in every crisis situation is usually a golden opportunity. I think actually in Mandarin Chinese, the word crisis and opportunity are the same word. Oh, wow. They're the same word. That's why when, the, when we were having a financial crisis in the States, people were saying crisis, crisis. You know, the Chinese were like, oh, opportunity to come and buy. Yeah, we're going to. I mean, it's, it, there's a genuine thing there, though, because every crisis is somebody's opportunity. I mean, it is. Whether we take advantage of it or someone else does. Can you think in the Bible of a time of real crisis? What about the story of David and Goliath? Everybody know the story of David and Goliath? That's a pretty well-known story. You heard of David? Heard of Goliath? You heard of the Bible? Are you awake? <laughs> All right, just making sure. All right. All right. David and Goliath. David and Go David, what was the crisis in that story? There's a, giant, there's a giant Philistine. He's coming out. And he's taunting the armies of Israel. You know, nobody come, come beat me. Send out a warrior. And, you know, and everybody's shaking and trembling. And little David, he's like, hey, man, who's going to go out and fight this guy? And everybody else is looking at the size of the giant and the problem and all of that. I mean, because the guy was like 10 feet tall, you know, the Bible says. Uh, but what was David focused on? David was focused on the reward. He kept going around and asking, hey, what's going to be given to the guy who, who, who defeats this giant? What's going to be given to the man who conquers him? You know, it's like, oh, the, the guy won't have to pay taxes anymore. That's, that's great. Okay, well, and then he keeps asking, well, what's going to be given to the guy who, who beats the giant? You know, and they're all scared. And they're like, what's going to be given? He's like, well, the king said he'll give his daughter's hand in marriage to the guy who defeats the giant. You know, and what happens? His brothers are like, oh, man, just get out of here, Dave. You're always trying to stir up trouble and make us look bad. Just get out of here. There's always the naysayers, always people... Often, sometimes in our own family, people close to us, people who know our errors and have seen our flaws that can't imagine God doing something great with us. But David just kept asking. And then it, the king found out. You remember the story? The king heard that somebody out there asking what's going to happen for the guy who defeats the giant, and he calls David for. And you know the story. He goes out. He takes the risk, right? He takes the risk, and what happens? He wins. He cuts the giant's head off with the giant's own sword. Right? I mean, the thing is, God is calling us. I mean, it's part of just our faith walk. <clears throat> it's part of our faith walk that we have to, we have to take risks. Yeah. Yeah. Many of you, there's a lot of you here today, you've already taken a lot of risks in your life. I mean, I mentioned getting married. How many of you are married? 
You've taken risks. How many of you started your own business? Okay, you took risk. Is there a risk in starting your own business? Sure. You're walking away from a steady paycheck. There's risk involved. Was it worth it? Starting your own business? Was it worth it? All right, I got some mixed results here. Okay, we, all right, we're walking it out. Um, you know, stepping out in ministry, when, if you, when you're feeling God's calling you to do something or start something, there's risk involved. There's risk involved. And some of you have done that. You've done that. The Bible says in Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Yeah. Part of this walk of faith, you know, uh, you think about the, I remember when we would walk in the villages, in the dark, and the, the hills and the mountains. If you're carrying a flashlight, you can kind of see where you're at. Yeah. And if you've got a village ahead or something like that, you can see far down the trail, like where you're going. But in between where you're at and where you're going, there's a long stretch of dark. Yeah. And I think that's the way it is in our faith walk. We can see in the scripture where God's calling us to. And the word of God, it's a, it's a, it's a lamp unto our feet. It shows me who I am. It shows me where I am. It shows me what I need. But it, 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 it's fo it, right here, and it shows me ahead. But there's so many steps in between sometimes that we don't know. And we, are walk we have to walk it out by faith. We have to walk it out by faith. Um, like I said at the beginning, all testimonies start with a crisis, a problem, or a risk. Anybody ever fly a kite? Yeah. What do you need to fly a kite? String. You need string. Okay, you gotta have. Oh, you gotta have a kite. Let's say you have the kite. What else do you do, need after you have the kite? Wind. You need wind, and you need the wind to go which way? It needs to go against the kite, right? You're going to pull the kite into the wind. It's the wind blowing against the kite, causing it to soar. You're pulling it into the wind. You pull it into the wind so it can fly. It's like, that's why my kite never flew. <laughs> I heard that. That's why it never got off. It's always running the wrong way. <sighs> Without risk, there is no reward. There is no testimony without a trial. And hidden in every crisis is an opportunity for God to be glorified in your life. And there are things that God is calling each of you to do. There are things that God is calling each of you to do. And I would say to you this morning, just do it. Those things that he speaks to you, it's not going to be just like while you're here at camp. But in life, in life, when you get out of here, in your day-to-day -day walk with the Lord, there's going to be things that the Lord speaks to your heart. It might be that person you're supposed to share your faith with. You know, that takes a risk. Yeah. You'll never evangelize anybody if you're not willing to take the risk. That's right. If you're not willing to step out. And some of the people you talk to will respond. Some won't. Mm -hmm. But we step out in faith. You might be planting the seed for that person later. The average person hears the gospel like seven times before they respond. Maybe you're going to be one of the first six. Yep. Amen? Yep. <clears throat> How many of you want to? You, 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 want, you want to be used by God? You want to be used by God? Then you have to be willing to step forward in faith in the moment. So I want us to stand to our feet. In, in Isaiah chapter 6, in Isaiah chapter 6, the Bible says that it was a time of great turmoil in the country. The king had died. There was trouble. In the prophet Isaiah, it was, it was a time of turmoil for him. But the Bible says during that time that he came into the temple and he saw a vision of the Lord. He saw the glory of the Lord in the temple. And when he saw it, he was like, I am a dead man because my, he's like, I, you know, I'm, I'm a man of unclean lips and I'm in the presence of God. And 
You know the story, God sends an angel to cleanse his lips. And when, when Isaiah's heart had been purified, when he'd been washed of that sin, he heard the voice of the Lord. And what did the Lord say? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Who is God speaking to? Well, Isaiah is the one there. But if you listen, it's almost like Isaiah has overheard a voice like the Trinity, like, like God's heart. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And what was his response? Here am I, Lord. Send me. And I want you to hear the... Just close your eyes where you're at. Don't worry about the person next to you. Don't worry about, you know, what you're going to do and all the other things just for a second. Let's just take a moment with God, just a second. And I want you to hear the voice of the Lord. Just hear the voice of the Lord speaking to you. Let him speak to you because there's things God's calling you to do. There's things God is calling to you, you to do. There's places he's going to want you to go. There's things he's going to want you to do. Some of those things are way down the line for you. They're years away. But I'm asking you to resolve it in your heart this morning to take the risk. Take the risk. When God comes calling, when God comes calling and comes knocking on your heart, take the risk. Respond. Respond. Respond with yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. Can you make that commitment this morning? I'd like you to just stretch out your hands. Stretch out your hands to the Lord. I want to pray for you. Father God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. I pray for each one of these young people. Father God, I pray for the leaders that are here, for the young people that are here, for everyone that's gathered in this place, Lord God. And I ask in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Lord, and I speak also for myself, Lord, that when you come calling on our hearts, when the moment is there, Father God, that we would sense it, that we could move, that we could be obedient, Father God, and that we would say yes, that we would swing the bat, that we would take the risk, Father God, that we would take the step of faith and do those things that the Lord has called us to do. Lord, that you would empower us, that in the moment, Father God, that you give us the grace to move forward. And if we fail, Father God, to get back up and keep moving forward, to let you speak to us, to let you guide us, I thank you, Lord, for your out, the outpouring of your spirit on these young people, on the adults, on myself, on all of us at this camp as we spent time in your presence receiving from you. I thank you for the work you're doing in their hearts. I thank you, Father God, that what we have prayed, you have heard. You said if we ask for anything according to your will, that you hear us. And we've asked, Lord God, we're asking for growth in these kids. We're asking for them to serve you, Lord God, for their lives to be fruitful, Father God, for them to be washed and cleansed and be changed. Father God, and I know that is your will, for your spirit to move through them, that they would be clean pipes, that, the glory, that your glory could flow through, Father God. And we ask now in Jesus' name for that to happen, not just today, but every day, years from now, that they would stand as testimonies of your grace and truth, and they would have their own testimonies of the great things that you have done because they were willing to step out in faith and take the risk. Thank you, Jesus, for their lives. Thank you for the work you're doing here. Yes, Amen. Amen. Say thank you, Lord, for loving me. I keep repeating it because I want you to get that down in your heart so much that he loves you, so much that he cares for you, so much that, that you know, he would cross any line to reach you. You know that? As a matter of fact, he did. He gave his life just for the opportunity to be in a relationship with you, just for the opportunity to have your relationship with Father God restored. He was willing to go to the point of giving his life for you. So Thank you, Lord, 